Hi, this is Warner Chavez with Data Platform Virtual Summit 2021, and welcome to Building a Data Lake with Azure Synapse Analytics. As we go through the presentation and you are watching this recording, I am also in the chat right now so we can have a conversation about what's going on and feel free to make comments, questions as we go along the material. Allow me to introduce myself. I've been a DBA and consultant for 15 years. I used to be a database administrator in Hewlett Packard in Costa Rica and now a principal consultant Pythian in Ottawa, Ontario. I am a Microsoft Data Platform MVP. You can reach out to me on Twitter at Warchaff. Check out my personal website, createdatapros.com, and feel free to shoot me an email at warner at createdatapros.com. So the agenda for today, we're going to talk about recommendations and demos and the different options for executing a data lake workload on Azure Synapse Analytics. So we're going to cover, first of all, some very clear fundamentals for what I consider is a data lake so that we're all on the same page. Then we're going to talk about different Synapse components, different compute engines that you can use for executing a data lake workload inside the Synapse environment. And of course, we're going to have demos on how to do all those things as we go over the different compute engines. Then at the end, there will be some time for questions as well. So first, let's talk about what exactly is a data lake. So fundamentally, a data lake is a large capacity storage. It can be used for structured, semi-structured, or unstructured data. Back in the days, you know, if you've been doing data lake uh, projects for maybe 10 years or more, people would buy very, very large SANs on-premises, and then they would create massive Hadoop clusters, and that's usually how most people did their data lake slash big data workloads. The cloud, of course, has come to change the game quite a bit. Now most people deploy cloud storage and use some sort of cloud compute, such as Azure Synapse Analytics, to process that data. A data lake, then, is used for storing and analyzing data that does not immediately belong in the data warehouse. For example, if you have some IoT data, some logs, some other type of data that maybe is not completely cleansed or structured, then it's a good candidate to leave it in the data lake and doesn't have to be loaded and schematized into a governed table inside the data warehouse. Now, a lot of people usually ask me, can we just replace everything with a data lake and in my opinion right now I would say that most people will still have a data warehouse and a data lake as well now there are other companies such as Databricks that are really bringing forward the concept of a lake house but I don't think it's really caught up completely yet but it is a very interesting idea as well now, data lake can be used for reports, analytics, but also a very important use case for data lake is to be able to run ML experiments, for example, on data that is not completely structured, or just to do ad hoc exploration. For example, if you have analysts that wish to just browse and query the data without having to create, again, a full-blown table that is in a governed data model inside the enterprise data warehouse. Something very important to always keep in mind, I emphasize to everybody, just because you have a data lake doesn't mean it has to turn into a data dump. So make sure that you do have some data governance inside your data lake as to what goes in the data lake and what doesn't go in the data lake. Try to have a standard folder structured. Try to have proper permissions in your data lake as well so you do not end up with just a big, bucket of everything but you actually end up but you actually end up with a true data lake that can be used for all the use cases that I just mentioned now inside Azure we have a couple of services that can be the storage layer or the data lake itself we have Azure blob storage and we also have Azure data lake gen 2 now, Data Lake Gen 1 does not exist anymore. It's been deprecated, and it was a completely separate service from Azure Blob Storage. So Microsoft went back into the drawing board, and Azure Data Lake Gen 2 is actually a service built on top of the Azure Blob Storage. But both of them can still be used for massive file storage. So which one should you use? 
First is keep in mind they will both allow large capacity elastic storage. So that is already covered. Technically, both of them can be used for data lake. That is okay. However, ADLS G2 has native support for a hierarchical structure, meaning you can do actual metadata operations at the folder level. Now, some people will say, well, I have blobs on my Azure blob storage that actually have paths on them. So how is it not the same? And the reason is that actually blob storage, those paths that you see, they are not structured as actual folders. It just simply looks like that, but it's just a flat blob name that happens to have some slashes and some names on it. So when you rename 1000 items on blob storage because you moved from one folder to the other, you're actually just literally renaming a thousand objects. When you just move a thousand items in ADLS G2, it's just a metadata operation, just how it would be, for example, in your local laptop. ADLS G2 has native support then for also file and folder level security, which is missing from blob storage, which is usually account level or container level security. And my recommendation is to use ADLS G2 because it is natively integrated with the Synapse workspace. So it will be a breeze to work with Synapse Analytics and to build your own enterprise data lake if you just stick to using the Data Lake Storage Gen 2 account that will be integrated with your Synapse workspace anyway. Now, Synapse itself has multiple options for the compute layer, meaning the compute engine that you're gonna use to read and analyze that data. You can have the dedicated SQL pool. This is what used to be known as Azure SQL Data Warehouse and is the full-blown MPP engine. Then we also have the serverless SQL pool, also known as the on-demand pool. This is the new engine that Microsoft introduced when Azure Synapse came out. And this one allows us to query the data lake on demand. So we only pay when queries are actually running and you pay by the amount of data that is consumed, not by how long the query is running for. And then finally, the last compute option inside Synapse is of course the Synapse Spark. So you have a full blown Spark engine inside the Synapse Analytics environment and this Spark engine already comes customized with a few internal changes that Microsoft has done so that it is optimized to run in Azure and against the IDLS G2 as well. So let's talk first about the dedicated SQL pool. What are the data lake capabilities on the dedicated SQL pool? Well, the main capability is that you can read from storage through an object known as an external table. So these external tables support multiple formats for the underlying data, such as the limited text or parquet, for example. It is fully parallel SQL-based querying. So even though you are querying underlying data lake storage, these queries can be fully parallel going over multiple files in a folder, for example, and it is all transparent to you. You are just writing SQL. It does require dedicated compute. So that means that the cluster, the MPP cluster of the SQL dedicated pool must be up and running when you try to query this. Keep in mind then there's cost, obviously, even if you are not querying, the cluster is up and running. So it's gonna charge you every single time that it's up and running. Now you can still pause it, very common. That most people will pause their dedicated SQL pool, but it is not automatic. So you have to keep that in mind. And then the biggest use case, of course, of using external tables built into the dedicated SQL pool is that the dedicated SQL pool is where you're going to place your structure tables. Usually big, big fact tables are gonna be in column store tables. And then by using external tables that look at the underlying data lake storage, you can easily integrate these unstructured or data lake tables with your structured tables that are in the column store SQL server format in your SQL dedicated pool. 
And one last thing, because this is the dedicated SQL pool, it is really well instrumented. It has DMVs. It can be queried very easily to look at what's happening under the hood because, again, it's built on that enterprise SQL Server engine. So let's check out a demo of external tables on the dedicated SQL pool. And we're also going to be querying some DMVs to give you an idea of the internal information that we can get from the SQL pool engine when you query external storage. Okay, I'm in the Synapse workspace and let's look at the dedicated SQL pool. So the first thing to know, if you go down here to manage, is that as I mentioned before, the dedicated SQL pool must be running for you to be able to use it. So it's not serverless where it just consumes by query, but you got to start or stop the cluster to make sure it's up and running for you to start querying it. As you see here, I just started it right before starting the demo and now it is online. I can also scale it back and forth. So if I need to process more or less data from my data lake, I also have that flexibility of scaling up if I wanted to the cluster. I'll click on here on scale. And then we can see here that you can increase the performance level. Right now I'm in the lowest DW100C all the way to DW30,000, which uses a lot of nodes here at that level. So I'm just going to leave it here and I'm just going to cancel right now. That's good enough just to show for the demo. You can see now that SQL pool is online and running and we can actually see how we can do those external tables. So I'm going to go back here. I already have my script up and running and let's walk through it little by little. So the first thing is that to be able to query the underlying data lake storage, I create a new database scoped credential. In this case, I just call it Synapse Identity. And I say with the identity of the managed identity. What does that mean? So what that means is that the Synapse SQL dedicated pool has an Azure AD identity by itself. And then you grant permissions on the data lake storage to that identity. So that way I don't have to put in any actual credentials. That's the cool part about using the managed identity. Then I have to create an external data source. In this case, I'm just gonna call it Synapse. I have to specify the type. Now, if you are going to be doing it against Blob Storage or Azure Data Lake, then the type is Hadoop and then the location here. So you can see I'm using this format. It's called Synapse in my Warner Data Lake um, ADLS G2 account, okay? And these I have already pre-created before of the demo. These are metadata objects. Now, so you have a credential, you have a data source, and then the last thing that you need is a file format. In this case, let's look at the file format that I defined. This is a format type of the limited text I'm setting the field terminator to be the comma. So I'm trying to create a CSV, the limited file format, the string delimiter. I don't have any in this case. I'm passing in the date format because it's not a standard date format, but using the different placeholders, I can pretty much build a parser for the date format that is very flexible. And then in the first row here, I can see where it says this two. Basically what that means is to skip the header row for this particular file format. So if I didn't have a header row, then I wouldn't need that first row option. I would just start reading data right away from the uh, from row number one, right? In this case, because it has a header, then I'm specifying it here. Now, something that I recommend for people that are going to be mixing structured and unstructured data in your dedicated pools is that you create a schema specifically for the reading of the data directly from data lake. In my case, I usually call them stage. And then I can create those external tables in stage. And every time that I query something on the stage schema, I know that I am hitting an external table that is going to the underlying data lake storage okay so let's look at how that works you see here the construct is pretty simple it says create external table and then i pass in the schema and the name and then i have to specify the schema so this is something important about working with the dedicated sql pool is that you do 
have to know the schema that you want to get from the files. It's not so much exploration or experimentation as it is with maybe the serverless pool and open row set, which we will look um, in the next demo, or with obviously all the flexibility of Spark and Python or Scala or Java or all the different languages. So this is more for semi-structured data and data that you want to grab from the data lake and you want to integrate with some of the other structured tables that you already have. So in my case, for example, I'm just declaring an ID field that's an integer, an artist name that's a var car, and then a rate. So some amount of money, I guess, that the artist we uh, pay them for, and that is another integer. And you can see some of them can be nullable, some of them are not, right? So we have that flexibility to specify exactly the schema that we're looking for, but we do not have to know what we're looking for. And then we put all the other pieces together. So we say with location, and you see here I have this location as a relative path, right? And the way that this works is that I specify the data source. So if I go back up here, we'll see the data source already says it's this data lake account and it's this data lake container. And then inside that container, it is going to look for this path, the music data artist rate CSV. And then the file format, I specify that specific CSV file format that I already um, created before. And then I have to say if a particular um, type gets rejected, then I want it to be based on the value and the rejection value in this case is going to be uh, zero, okay? So at this point, we have all the metadata in place to create the external table. So I'm gonna go ahead and create this external table and run that. I'm going to bring up the output here. And as you can see, this executes successfully. And all it did was line up all the different configurations and the metadata to be able to read from that particular file. It hasn't done any actual data reading operations, but with all the metadata properly configured in place right now, I can go in and just simply do a select star from that external table and it will be able to read all that data coming in from my data lake storage account. So you see here, data comes in and because we're working with the Synapse workspace, we do have nice capabilities. This is a, a there's some charting capabilities as well. If you wanted to work with that, you can save it as an image. If you have the table, you can export the results natively from the workspace. So that is also nice in terms of um, data lake capabilities where you have that ability to just do analysis exploration right off the bat from the Synapse workspace. You can export a CSV, JSON, or XML. And this is all coming straight down from the data lake storage, right? So this is the main capability for how you would interact with your data lake through the dedicated pool used by defining external tables and then simply using SQL to query for those external tables. Now, you might be thinking, what about if I find something that I like in my data lake and I wanna turn it into an actual table? So to do that, if you want to materialize that uh, external table into a real SQL MPP engine table, then you can do that really easily. The way to do it is to use the CTAS command, create table as command. Now, because we are turning this into a real uh, cluster table, we have to specify the distribution. In this case, I'm saying replicate, which means to put it in all the different distributions of the cluster. And I just want it to be a heap. I don't want it to be a column store in this case. So you have to specify these options because we're turning it from an external table that just has data lake storage into a real permanent table that will live inside the SQL MPP storage. Once we have that, we just have to pass in the select query that is going to generate the data to populate this table. So as you can see here, we say select star from stage dot artist rates, which we know this is an external table. And then I'm going to pass in this option with a label. Now, if you're not familiar with SQL Data Warehouse or SQL Dedicated Pools, labels are simply names that you can give to queries so that you can then locate them easily on the DMVs for analysis. So I'm going to put in this label here 
so that later on I'm going to be able to query the DMVs and get the information I want about this particular data load that I did through the external table. So I'm going to go ahead and run this right now. So we're going to materialize that table. And it's done. And now I can simply query on my permanent schema here. It's called music service. And we'll see there's no issues anymore. This will be pretty fast. This is now a completely separate table. So this is very, very important to understand. Now that I've materialized it inside the cluster, this table has basically forked away from the external table. The external table will keep looking for uh, the storage file. So if the file changes, you'll see the change in the external table. But this new artist rates table that we have materialized is now basically a copy in the cluster SQL MPP table storage format. And it has nothing to do now with the actual underlying uh, data lake storage. Okay, so that's something to keep in mind. Now, something very cool about the dedicated SQL pool, of course, is that it is fully instrumented just like how you would expect from the full-blown SQL engine. So I just have to pass in that label. So you see here, for example, I, if I want to analyze what happened at the request level, there's a DMV called sys.dmpdw exec requests, and it has a column called label. And I just have to say where that column label equals the label that I'm interested in. So if we go back, remember, I used this option label when I did that create table ask command. So I can go back down and just reuse that same label to grab the information that I'm interested in. And there's always some interesting stuff here. So we can see the status, of course, it's completed. Since I just ran it a few minutes ago, you can look at how long it took to run that uh, particular command. The command is there as well. You can see the importance and the group that was given to it. The importance and the group is basically the workload management that you get from the SQL dedicated pool. Now, I'm not going to go into detail on that. That's really out of scope for a session like this one. But just to say that there's ways so that you can prioritize a specific queries, right? So that's also kind of cool in terms of data lake uh, interaction. You can say, for example, your enterprise reports will have higher importance. And if somebody's just doing some ad hoc exploration against the data lake, they can just have normal or even low importance, right? And then we can see here, for example, if there's a result cache hit, SQL dedicated pool has a result cache. So you will be able to see that information there as well. So this is at the specific request level. Now there's different levels that you can look at this instrumentation to see what's happening behind the scenes. We can look at the worker level as well. So let me run that and we'll see. And we'll let, get some more interesting information here as well. So this is at the worker level. So what actually means here, we can see everything that was happening. You can see the readers, writers, and uh, the different operations that the workers or the threats were doing when they were um, loading this file into the MPP cluster. You can get information such as the bytes per second, how many bytes were processed, how many rows were processed, and what the writers did as well on the particular query. And you can see the lapse time, CPU time, and uh, buffers, etc., etc. So the important thing here, of course, is that once you start interacting a lot with your data lake storage, there's DMVs that will allow you to pick up whether somebody or some uh, particular process is consuming a lot more data than others inside your MPP cluster. And then you can decide whether that's okay. You can create a report on it. You can investigate if it's taking a lot of resources from the cluster and so on, okay? And then the last one I wanted to show is that the distribution level. And this one at the distribution level really allows you to understand the different steps that a SQL dedicated pool takes to read the data and then load it into the cluster itself. So let me show you here. You'll see what happens here is we get what is being happening on each distribution. And then you can look at the different commands 
for what is happening behind the scenes, right? So for example, here we can see that internal tables were created because I wanted to create a new replicated table that was in the cluster storage. So all those new internal tables were created. We can see then as well that there were some um, show statistics commands that were run on all those distributions as well and we can also see here at the end where the statistics are updated on that table after it got reloaded all this happened automatically when i materialized that um, table from storage into the uh, real cluster mpp permanent storage all right so takeaways here of course is that the main way to interact with the dedicated pool is through the external table the external table allows you to query directly the data lake storage and make it transparent you can materialize it easily into a permanent cluster table and you can also use the different DMVs at the request worker or distribution level to really get an idea of what the dedicated pool is doing under the covers. Okay, now let's talk about the serverless SQL pool. So what are the data lake capabilities for that one? Well, basically, the serverless SQL pool was literally built to do data lake. It can read from storage through external tables, such as the ones that you just saw that I used for the dedicated pool, but Microsoft also augmented the open row set function to really have a lot of flexibility into how you read from the data lake. It will support multiple formats, same as the dedicated SQL pool, and it is SQL based querying as well, so you can just write SQL and you don't have to write any other language. SQL is mostly known by everybody that works in the data industry, and you can get to that underlying uh, unstructured or semi structured data that you might have. And using Open Roset, as I mentioned, it has been really augmented with very flexible constructs to be able to pick fields, parse, parse the folder structure, etc. And don't worry, we will look in detail at that on the demos. Something very different from the dedicated SQL pool, as the name will say, is that the serverless pool does not have dedicated compute. It just consumes compute on demand. When you run a query, it consumes the compute based on how much data that query read. And then after the query is over, you stop consuming. So this is very attractive for exploration or experimentation type of workloads because if an analyst just runs some queries to do some exploration a couple of hours of the day, they can do it through the serverless pool with a very a low cost compared to just having the dedicated SQL pool always up and running. So if you're looking to provide a lot of flexibility into flat storage exploration, then the serverless pool is a really good option for that data lake use case. And last, it has good um, integration with Spark because there's an integrated Spark catalog built into the serverless pool. And it's also integrated with the Synapse link. If you're not familiar with the Synapse link, it's in real time uh, ETL uh, from Cosmos DB right now, it's enabled. So all the changes that you do in Cosmos DB, they're immediately available in Synapse for analytical querying. And that can be done through serverless too. But the only thing to keep in mind on serverless is that it's more of a black box. It's not instrumented like the dedicated SQL pool. It doesn't give you a lot of insight as to what it's doing under the covers. So if you are looking at enterprise reporting that has to be high performance, the serverless pool is not for that, okay? Right now, in my opinion, that use case for the serverless pool is a data lake use case of doing ad hoc exploration or ad hoc experimentation. All right, so let's check out a demo and let's look at that new construct of open row set on the serverless SQL pool querying. Okay, I'm back in the Synapse workspace, and this time we are going to be using the on-demand serverless pool. So this one I don't have to start, it's always up and running because it is used on-demand. As you can see here, when it says connect, 
access into the serverless built-in pool and I have a database inside my serverless pool called demos. Now you can work with external tables pretty much the same way as they work with the dedicated SQL pool. So instead for this demo, I'm going to focus on the new functionality added to the open row set function to be able to explore and analyze data. So first, how do you use it? So for example, here, I'm just going to do a select top 100 from open Roset bulk, and then I pass in the absolute URL for this file. And there's a couple of different options to do. As you can see here, I'm doing the full URL. So it says HTTPS and all my information from my data lake account. Or if you already created a data source, then you can actually just pass in the relative URL and configuring the data sources the same way as we did it with a dedicated pool. So I'm not going to do it again. And then the only other thing you need to pass is the format. In this case, for example, is Parquet. So let's go ahead and run this. Let me bring up the output up here. And as you can see, we get the results right away. And we can also have the same functionality of charting if we want to try charting the results. And we also get messages back from what was happening inside the engine as it was reading data from the data lake storage. However, keep in mind, serverless does not have that's much detail and information from a thread level, distribution level, etc., as it does on the dedicated SQL pool. So it's kind of like a black box in that way. That's why I always say it's not really fit, in my opinion, for enterprise reporting at this point. It's more for analysis, uh, ad hoc analysis, exploration, or experimentation, okay? Because you don't really have a control to try to make the query go faster if you need it to, okay? So that's with absolute URL. As you can see, it can work as well with a relative URL. So I'm going to go ahead and run it and we'll actually get the same information. In this case, again, I only passed the relative URL because I had a pre-configured data source object and format is just the built-in part case. So that works really well. If you want, you can also check the collation in your database. So I can go ahead and run this and we'll see. This is the default collation that you get from your serverless pool database. If you want to, you can actually go ahead and alter that if you wanted to, just an alter database command and say a different collation and pass it in. You can do that back and forth if you wanted to, go one with the other, and then it would change how it works with the data. Now, if you want to see the inferred data types of an open ROSET query, you can use this store procedure called SP Describe First Result Set because sometimes you will want to see what the data types are be before you start writing another SQL query. So for example, I'm going to run this and then I will see here in the output, I get a row for every single column that it open row set is grabbing from the parquet and you can see the types that it has created. For example, you can see here, it says for every single string coming from parquet because parquet doesn't have length built into it, then it assumes it's a varchar 8000, which might not be the case, right? So you can actually overwrite these values if you wanted to. Here, for example, I am doing another select top 100 from the same parquet file with the same open row set, but now I'm specifying, hey, the artist name is actually not a huge string that needs 8,000 characters. Varkar 100 is fine. And actually it's not the, a built-in collation that I have, but I wanna collate this one specifically with this UTF collation. And then the rest just go ahead, right? So if I go ahead and run this, you will see it runs just fine, right? And just internally, the data type that is being passed on is now this one and is being collated with this particular collation that I selected, okay? Now, if you are not dealing with Parquet and you're dealing with CSV, there are actually two versions of CSV. When, <clears throat> when possible, you should use the parser version 2.0, like in this case, and this parser version, it's actually faster than the previous version. It's an improved version that uh, Microsoft has created. So you can see here, I'm, now, I'm just doing a select top one, just so that you see the different options. We pass in the path to the CSV, the CSV file, and then parser 2.0, as I mentioned. However, there is still access to the 1.0 
a version of the parser. The downside of the 1.0 is that besides it's supposed to be slower internally, but it does require you to specify a schema, which is a little bit annoying. You can see here in this case, it was just inferred all the types. And then the other thing though, the reason why you might still want to use 1.0 is that 1.0 does have support for compression. So if you have some gzip files that you want to parse and inside their CSVs inside that gzip file, then you can use the 1.0 parser and that will work and you can use it for reading data off your data lake storage with serverless. So I'll go ahead here and you see this is a .csv.gc file but it still gets read properly and we get our data out because I'm using the parser version 1.0. Okay, 2.0 doesn't have support for compression yet. Now let's try to see, for example, how do we work with JSON in this case with serverless. JSON is a very popular format. A lot of people are storing JSONs in their data lakes right now. So this is a great format to see more or less how we work with it. And pretty much you just have to follow the same structure as what do we, you would do with uh, SQL Server and the JSON extensions. So for example here, <clears throat> I'm just gonna say select JSON content. I'm gonna say this is the file and the format. In this case, I'm gonna put CSV, but it's not really a CSV, right? It's a JSON file, but CSV just basically means the limited text in this case. And then you can see for all the other terminators, I'm putting this invalid character. So the basically SQL Server, or in this case, the serverless SQL engine is going to read everything from the file itself and just output it as one big string. So I can go ahead and do that. Oh, one moment. So let me scroll this down so we have more room. And go ahead. And you can see in this case, basically I just have one column, one value. It's just the whole string was read in one shot, okay? Now, if I do want to work with the contents, obviously, then we have to work in the same way that we would do that with um, the JSON functions in SQL Server, right? So you grab that JSON string, then you do a cross apply open JSON. This is really the key, the new function that Microsoft introduced. I believe it was in SQL 2016. And then I start to grab items out of that JSON. In this case, for example, I'm grabbing the um, users uh, array out of this particular JSON file. So if I go ahead, I'm going to run this. And you can see here now we're starting to get into the actual JSON itself. Every single user now has its small chunk of JSON as the value of a particular row. So we're not quite there yet, but again, you just have to continue working with that type of open JSON format. So in this case, for example, we're gonna do the same thing. And you can see here, the big difference is that I am doing a final cross apply open JSON where I specify the specific columns I want and where they should come from, right? So dot user ID, here's the um, the, the field basically called user ID, the field called gender, the field called age, etc., etc. right? Go ahead and run that. And you can see I get the values now properly split from JSON as a fully tabular output that I can then use for whatever other analysis I wanted to. I could save it back as a table. I could save it as a different format of file, or I could use it for some sort of other analysis, joins, etc., etc. Right. So a lot of flexibility in how we process JSON because of the built-in open JSON function that is also included with SQL Server. Um, this, uh, keep in mind, it's easy to work with open ROSET as well with other types of data types, even where they're mixed. For example, if you have a Parquet file, Parquet itself can also be mixed, so it's not necessarily normalized. So you see here, in this parquet file, we have a string user ID column, and then we have a column called JSON props. That is, again, just a chunk of JSON, right? So it's not really fully normalized in this case. We have to do pretty much the same thing, just use that cross apply open JSON to take those items out, and I can run this and I get the results right away. Now notice something cool here is that once I specify 
this schema to apply to the JSON, I can actually go ahead and right away do a WHERE clause against that column that was specified out of the JSON, right? So I don't have to, let's say, save it into some sort of intermediate file or intermediate table before I can immediately filter on it or uh, order by it as well, right? So that's really cool about the way that the JSON functionality works with the SQL engine. And then finally, the only thing to keep in mind about the serverless, people ask me all the time, well, what about XML? And this is the shocking part. A lot of people don't know this, but XML data type does not work in the SQL dedicated pool or the serverless pool. Um, this is the XML data type, of course, it works in SQL Server if you're running SQL Server. So you might be surprised to see that it does not exist in the dedicated pool or the serverless pool, but that is a fact. You can load the data just as a regular string, but you won't be able to easily parse it or run some sort of XPath query or anything like that. Now, I know, of course, a lot of you still work a lot with XMLs and you might have data lakes that have some XML files as well, but for that, we'll have to look at the next compute engine that is inside Synapse, which would be Spark. So we'll look at that on the next demo. Okay, and finally, let's talk about the Synapse Spark. So data lake capabilities of Spark, of course, Spark is built 100% to support data lake workloads as basically the air to Hadoop and MapReduce. Spark has taken the analytical big data world by storm, basically grouping all the different uh, use cases, right? Being able to do batch and streaming, SQL, and all these other things in an open source manner so that it's cross-platform as well. So Spark has native support for reading and writing from storage that is built into the DNA of Spark. It has multiple language support, so you can have Java, Scala, Python. There's even a Spark.net that works on C Sharp now. And of course, SQL. There's a massive amount of libraries and extensibility built into Spark because of that open source community, and it just continues to grow. So Spark is a really robust option for data lake workloads, including as well the native capability to do notebooks, which is a very cool way to collaborate. And you have the cluster flexibility in Synapse that you wouldn't get on Spark if you tried to run it on-prem, right? In Synapse, you can have different sizes of Spark clusters. You can have auto-scaling Spark clusters and you also have multiple versions of Spark. Right now, the 2.4, I believe, is the uh, main version. By the time that this is published in the, during the conference, maybe this will have changed, but right now, Spark 3.0 is a preview version inside Synapse. So 3.0 is the latest version of Spark. That one is already in preview. So it does give you a lot of options into how many nodes you want, how you want to run the cluster, if it wants to spin up uh, on demand, and if it goes to sleep after a while of being idle, a lot of flexibility into how you run Spark in Synapse so that it matches your use case and it can be cost efficient as well. So let's take a look at Spark capabilities in Synapse to run your data lake workloads and process data on the Synapse Spark. Okay, I'm back in the Synapse workspace and the first thing we're going to do, going here into Manage and then Apache Spark Pools. And you'll see here I have my demo pool right now. If I go and click on it, I'll be able to look at the configuration of the pool. And then I just wanna show real quick all the flexibility that you get by running your Spark inside Synapse, which makes it a really, really good option. Again, when you're building data lakes, it's almost unthinkable not to have Spark as some part of your solution today. So I'm gonna go ahead. <clears throat> so I'm gonna go ahead and press on new just to give you the options here that you get. So look at the configurations. You have from small machines for four V cores, 32 gigs, all the way to 80 V cores and half a terabyte of RAM in one node of a cluster. So you can get really beefy nodes if you are really processing data in like the dozens of terabytes or hundreds of terabytes range. And the number of nodes as well, you can scale it. Here it's set to three up to um, 10 if you have auto scale enabled. 
and look at how many notes you can get. You can get up to 200 notes in this configuration. I'm not going to create it, of course. This is just for the demo. And then the other thing you can select is the automatic pausing. So you can have it so that if the Spark cluster has been idle for more than a few minutes, then it can shut itself down to save you some costs. And you can also have the version of Apache Spark, different versions loaded. Right now, 3.0 is in preview. All right, so I'm not going to go and create any of this, of course, because I already have my environment set up. So I'll just discard the changes, but I did want to show how many options there are in terms of how you create and manage your Spark inside Synapse. I'm going to go back to develop and I have my demo notebook right here. And first thing, just want to run through some of the capabilities of Spark if you've never used Spark and the notebook environment as well, so that you can get an idea of how well you can work with your data lake with Synapse Analytics. First of all is to keep in mind this is a fully dynamic, really rich notebook environment. You can share the notebooks, you can collaborate with other people in the notebooks. It is integrated as well with GitHub. So any changes that you do to the notebook, go ahead and press commit and it actually commits into your Git repository. So fully integrated with source control, which I think is really, really valuable. So I set myself in my Spark database and then inside the Synapse uh, Spark, there are some pre-configured Microsoft utilities to do lots of different things that will help you work with Spark inside this environment. So in this case, for example, I'm just running the help of the Microsoft Spark utilities and you see there is a bunch of different libraries. In this case, I'm in the .fs namespace. So it has a bunch of different functions on doing things with the file system. Right. So, for example, in this case, if I want to see the different files that I have in a folder, I can just do this small bit of Python and say, give me the uh, list of the contents in the music data folder, for example. Go ahead and run that. And we see I get the whole list of files inside that folder. And there's some other utilities as well. If you want to be in your notebook or in a Spark job, you want to keep track of the different uh, settings for the environment. There's also some functions in the EMV namespace of the utilities. It gives you the username, user ID, the job ID, the workspace, the pool name, and all kinds of stuff that you can use for tracking and logging the operations that you're doing on your Synapse Spark. Of course, Spark as well is very flexible and very robust in terms of data lake capabilities. So I'm just going to run through a few things here in case you're not familiar with Spark, just to give you an idea of how easy it is to manipulate and work with your data lake when you're dealing with Spark. So first thing is to load data into a data frame from Parquet. So very simple, spark.read.load. We pass in the URL of that Parquet file and the format as Parquet. And then I'm going to go ahead and run it and just say show command. Now, all of this is PySpark. As you can see here at the top, the notebook, you can change the default language. I usually use PySpark just because I prefer Python myself, but you can use other languages like I mentioned before, such as Java, Scala, etc. Okay. If you're not familiar with the terminology, a data frame is basically a virtual representation of a distributed data set. And it does not materialize anything until you run an action, such as show in this case, which only displays the top 20, I believe, items. And in this case, a show simply prints them as text on the output of the notebook. I can also run the load command, in this case from format CSV just as how we did before. And we can see here, I'm not specifying any schema. I'm going to let Spark infer the schema as well. So I'm going to read this here. And obviously Spark in this case, doesn't try really to do anything with it. It simply says, okay, well, I'm just going to load it as a string for both columns because no schema was actually passed in. Now at this point, if you look at this, of course, this is all text-based output. So there's not much you can do with it other than copy paste it. Not really useful like that. There's this display function when you're dealing with your data frames. That will allow you to have a richer output into the notebook. So you have a table that is actually sortable. You have the chart, same as how we had the chart capability in the SQL experience. And we also have the capability again to export the results. So very rich experience here in the notebook in case of, you know, you're trying to do some work, some exploration, ad hoc analysis, etc., And you want to be able to share those results as well. Okay. So we have that. 
Let's say, for example, if you want to uh, move into a pandas data frame, that pandas library is a very, very popular numerical um, analysis uh, library in Python. So all that is available inside Spark as well. This is also part of the extensibility and richness of Spark, is that everything that runs in Python basically can be integrated easily with Spark. So you can see here in this case, I'm turning this data frame into a pandas data frame. And once it's converted into a pandas data frame, then I can just run a native pandas functions into it and again if you're not familiar with it go ahead and either search online or in uh, uh, other course websites on pandas there's a lot of resources there into the type of analysis that you can do with pandas is a very powerful very popular python library but just to keep in mind here what i'm trying to show is that uh, Spark runs uh, fully integrated with Python as well, so that you can bring in almost any library. For example, in this case, I brought in um, a custom library into my Spark cluster. So if you just want to see the list of all the Python libraries in your cluster, you can actually iterate over them, looking at package resources, and then the list, well, it's pretty big. I'm not going to go through the whole thing. But you can see, for example, I imported a library called pandas profiling. And then there's this uh, object called a profile report. I'm just going to go ahead and run it. And then the cool thing about this, again, is the extensibility of Spark that allows me to simply grab a Python library that I found online that I thought looked kind of neat. And then I easily import it into the Spark cluster inside Synapse. And I can even look at the HTML output integrated here into the uh, notebook itself. And you can see here this profile report is a numerical profiling, uh, data set profiling um, library that I found online. So really, really cool. You don't have to do a lot of work. And then immediately you can get the fully integrated details of the data set all done through this library. Um, really easily and right inside the notebook experience, okay? Then, of course, sometimes you will have a schema that you want to apply to a file, which is very simple to do. You can create a new schema struct and then apply that to the file that you load, in this case, the CSV file. So you see here, I create this struct with all the names of the columns and the types, and then I just do a read load into that schema. Let me run it right now. And that is completed. And now I can print the schema. And we'll see, we have the different types. And I can check the contents as well by just simply doing a show command. And again, I will get just the top 20. Now, at this point in time, this signup string, even though it's clearly a date, it's being treated as a string, right? If I look here, signup string says it's a string, it's not a date. So we can easily use, again, some Python conversion functions to say to date this signup string with this format that I pass in. And something to keep in mind is that data frames are immutable. So what that means is that you're not really changing the structure of the existing data frame. What you do is you're creating a new data frame with the change that you want to apply to the existing data frame. Let me run this cell right now. And you'll see here what we're doing is creating a new data frame. Then I'm printing the schema of the new one. And this schema now, we have this sign up date that is now a date. And you can see here the difference in the display, right? So sign up string was what we were reading from the file itself. And sign up date is the actual date data type now understood by Spark. And then if necessary, you can also use Spark to save any sort of data frame back as a full-blown Spark table. And the cool thing about Synapse as well is that Spark tables go into the Spark catalog that is fully integrated with Synapse. So you later down, later down the path, if you want to query this Spark table from the serverless SQL pool, you can do that as well. So I'm just going to go ahead and run that. And then this job is complete and this table is now saved. And if I go into the data browser, now I go into my music service Spark database. If I go into the tables, you'll see the user details table is there. And it can be browsed and queried just like any other regular table, which is pretty cool. And is 
the nice thing about the integrated Synapse workspace experience. Now I can try to do JSON as well. I'm going to ahead and run it. And all I did is put format equals JSON. And we'll see what's going to happen here. It's actually going to fail. The reason why it fails is because it's in the documentation for a Spark. It says each line must contain a separate self-contained valid JSON object. So it doesn't do multi-line JSON by default, which is kind of strange, uh, but that's the way it is. And when I do, for example, simply pass the option to say multi-line is true, then it has no problems reading the JSON file. So this is something that you might run into if you are working with JSON simply. You think that the default would be to support multi-line, but the default is actually no multi-line and uh, multi-line true is what you want if you have a JSON file that is uh, human readable with an object that spans over multiple lines. Now if I just switch this flag, immediately it reads the JSON properly, service users is a top level object that's an array and it's composed of structs that have all these fields. Um, so you can see it actually understands it pretty well. It's just a matter of setting this flag that is not the default. And if you are working with JSON inside Spark, it is somewhat similar to working with JSON on the SQL engines. Every time that we do cross apply open JSON, we are going one level deep into the JSON to try to reach new values that are in the hierarchy. In the case of Spark and PySpark, what we do is this explode function to do pretty much the same thing. So I can run this right now and we'll see what it looks like as we go further along. So you see here right now I have users flat. So we went one level deep into the JSON. Now I have one JSON object per row, right? So now we need to just go one further level deep. So what do I do is once I'm at this level, I can actually select the specific columns out from the JSON. Go ahead and run that. And we see now I have the tabular output that I was looking for, right? So it's very similar to how we did it with the SQL um, dedicated pool or the serverless pool. It's just a matter of using explode and select instead of the cross apply, open JSON and select as well. And now the other thing that I was mentioning in the previous demo was that there is no built-in native XML in the SQL engines inside Synapse because XML data type hasn't been implemented, but there is no such problem on Spark. What we need to do is to use Python XML libraries. So in this case, for example, I'm just gonna read uh, text I'm just going to read the XML as a simple variable, one big string, okay? So you see here the schema of this particular data frame is just one string value. And the value is just the text of that XML. Now, I'm going to turn that value into a string variable. I'm simply going to say, give me the top value of this data frame. So I go ahead and run that. And I'm just going to select the first 100 characters, so you see what happens. So now I have this new XML text variable, and you can see it's just the flat XML, our string representation. And then what I do is I'm just going to use this XML e tree element tree object that is part of standard Python to simply slice that XML into the pieces that I want. So I grab the root, and then for example, in this case, I'm just going to grab five items just to show you how uh, it looks like when we're working with that XML library. And you see immediately we have five different user details items. So that's, we're already one level deep into the XML, which is what we want. And then to do them all, what we do is to create a new array. And for each one of the children in the array, I can get the particular attribute value that was inside the XML. So I'm gonna run that cell. And we see here, I was able to read 357,000 different users from that XML, right? And if I wanted to, I can actually turn that now into a data frame as well and into that tabular representation. So all I need to do is to say now that array of users is these are the names of the columns that I want and just keep the same data types and show me the values and again show is just going to show us the top 20 by default right so now 
I have the schema that I was expecting from the XML, and I have the tabular representation I wanted to as well. Again, what I want to showcase here, of course, is that unlike some of the limitations in the SQL pools, um, Spark gives you the full power and access of the entire Python library space, so there's usually some solution that you can tap into if necessary. And Spark as well also does SQL, so I can create views on top of data frames, for example, if I want to. And then once something has been created into a view or a table, I can simply run SQL against it without any issues, right? In this case, you see, I'm able to query from the data frame into a view uh, using just regular select star from notation, SQL, it's basic simple query. If I want to as well, I can save a managed table, so a Spark permanent table from a query. I'm basically just materializing a new data frame from a SQL query that I pass in, and then I save it as a brand new table. So I go ahead and run this, for example, and then we'll see that platform artist performance table will appear on the catalog when this execution is over. And it's done now, and if I go into the data, let me open it up, and let me refresh this, and you see here we have the new platform artist performance table, right? So very easy as well to materialize new tables based on your data lake storage contents by using the Spark and the data frames um, functionality, okay? And once it's been materialized, of course, you can just query it like any regular table. You don't have to do anything special to it. Just write some SQL against it and you get the result right away. If necessary, you can do show commands to look at the tables that are part of your catalog. So in this, uh, in this sense, Spark is pretty much very similar to a full relational uh, database engine. And then you can also describe the tables if you wanted to. So you get the actual schema, data types, and column names from the table and when it was created and by whom it was created, etc., etc. You can also define views on top of the tables. So this is something that some people think you can only do in the actual SQL pools, but no, you can actually define views in Spark too and just simply query them again just as if they were SQL. So this really um, <clears throat> native SQL and native table functionality that Spark has is why some people are saying that it is possible right now to create an architecture where you don't have a separate warehouse and you do everything as a lake house. So in my opinion, it really depends on what you're trying to do. If you're okay with some of the limitations that are still in Spark, then you could have a lake house implementation. But for the most part, to be able to cover most use cases in an enterprise implementation, I still recommend most people go with a data warehouse coupled by a data lake and a big data engine such as Spark, or if you wanna just do um, external tables or open row set, that's also a possibility as well, okay? That's it. And the only other thing I wanted to show, for example, is that if you look deep enough into the uh, libraries of Spark, you can find all support for almost any file type. So I looked up a library to just look at images, for example, and very easily I have a folder with some binary images in my Azure Data Lake, and Spark again has an ML uh, namespace that has an image library that has an image schema object, and you can see here I'm able to read every single uh, image from my data lake storage and look at the height, look at the width. I could even look at the actual data binary if I wanted to. I didn't select it in this case because it just looks like a bunch of uh, binary, but it is there. So if let's say, for example, you wanted to train some sort of ML model with the actual binary data from data lake storage images, you could do all that with Spark, which are things that you normally would not do with SQL, right? And this is really a big difference, of course, in being able to leverage data lake for a semi-structure or unstructured data and the power of the flexibility that you get from the full amount of libraries that are available in Spark. Okay, so let's do a recap. Azure Synapse Analytics 
offers full data lake support capabilities for all the use cases that I mentioned in terms of reading multiple file formats, in terms of doing exploration ad hoc, or even integrating with enterprise reporting by using all the different compute engines that you have at your disposal, whether it's the dedicated SQL pool that allows you to integrate that data lake storage with your structured tables, or you're using the serverless SQL pool for ad hoc exploration using that new augmented open roasted functionality, or whether you just go with 100% Spark, which is totally built for data lake workloads and has unlimited flexibility and extensibility. It's a lot of flexibility then to mix and match between the types of data. You can mix some of the data that you have on your dedicated pool with some data that you queried through the open row set on serverless with some data that you queried through Spark or you transform to Spark. You can mix and match anything that is on that data lake storage and do it all through these different options of compute engines. So it is a robust it's a very robust managed service by Microsoft where you don't have to manage any of the underlying infrastructure and it is a fully featured option giving us these three different compute engines plus the power, flexibility and elasticity of the Azure Data Lake Storage Gen 2 to build a true enterprise data lake. Special thanks to Microsoft for supporting Data Platform Geeks and SQL Server Geeks and community initiatives. Thank you. There's three ways to win prizes. You can post your selfie during the watching the conference with the hashtag DPS2021, give session and conference feedback on the website, and visit the sponsors and exhibitors on the virtual hallways as well. Follow on Twitter at the Data Geeks and at Data AI Summit. And at this point, I am right there in the chat with you. Let me know if you have some questions. If you don't and you think of something else later on, feel free to reach out on Twitter or email. And as always, and until next time, thanks for watching.